we're going to shift gears a tiny bit and start exploring specific systems that are at play in the world around us. Um, so first up, you know, because we all have to eat, is a group of folks who are going to take us into the food system and explain what food even has to do with climate change. Is that, is that my cue? Take it away, Riley. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. I uh, really appreciate it. Love seeing all these names uh, and the attendees. It, this, this type of event is one of my favorite things uh, of all time. I think specifically in the food space, there's uh, a lot of kind of overwhelm and a lot of news and a lot of it's very negative. So I think it's really wonderful to, um, with events like today, bring in two things to the table. One is some optimism and some proofs of concept. See what folks are doing that's working out there. And I think the other one I'm really hoping to get out of today is um, cross-pollination, right? Like there's so many folks working in this space and so many different um, avenues that it's really inspiring to kind of get out of your lane for a little bit and learn about what are folks doing over there? Like, what are they learning? What can we share that maybe I'm not finding in my day today? So I'm really excited about today. Hope you are as well. We got a truly astounding panel of folks here to share some of their life lessons and expertise working in and around food. Um, the theme of today is really a recipe for less waste and greater health, right? Thinking about how can we reinvent our food system a bit to work better for everybody. Uh, you know, as we saw in that framing video, if any of you caught it, um, how can we make food work better for all systems, right? The water system, the air system, the soil system, and of course the people system, right? Because it's not sustainability for just for the environment doesn't work if it doesn't also work for the people. We need to have a way to grow food that is people can participate in, they can make a viable living, it's accessible and equitable for all. And so there's so many, so many layers here um, that I'm, I'm pretty stoked to unpack with our panel today. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying that how we're growing food right now globally is not working in almost any definition of working. Um, we're not going to dwell too much on how and why it's broken. I think, you know, smarter folks than I or us have, have covered that really extensively. What I'm hoping we can touch on is how is food in our food system really tied to climate and sustainability in a general sense? And I do mean that both economically sustainable and also environmentally. And also, again, getting into these proofs of concept. What are folks doing to reinvent how food is is grown and who can grow food and how we can make it more sustainable and and hopefully break down some of these barriers that you know maybe obstacles you've heard about like how are folks getting around them how are we how are we really scaling some of these approaches um you know nationally and then globally as well um yeah so i guess quickly uh, i'm riley brock um professionally most recently i've worked at imperfect foods for about five years uh, doing content for them uh, that really gave me a crash course in all things food and sustainability and food waste I'm actually kind of between roles right now, but as you all know, you know, food waste and climate change do not take days off. So that's why I'm here today is to really, you know, join the, keep, keep the fight going. Um, and I'd love to just go around and quickly meet um, our panelists. I guess I'll go kind of Brady Bunch style who's on my screen. If we could start with Julia Collins, please. Hi, Riley. It's so great to be here with you and with the other panelists. I'm Julia Collins. I'm the founder and CEO of Planet Forward. We're on a mission to help tackle climate change by making it easier to bring climate-friendly products to market. So we help brands and suppliers to understand their carbon footprint, reduce emissions across their value chain, and then get on a path to being real zero, carbon neutral, by connecting them to high quality offsets. Um, ultimately, we see a future where all food products are part of the solution to climate change and are made from ingredients that support regeneration as opposed to degradation. Fantastic. Thank you for that intro. Uh, going again around my screen here, could we go to Jillian, please? Jillian Heichel. Oh, Jillian, I think you're muted. Sorry, uh -huh. I'm having a Golden Girls moment. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Jillian Heichel. I am an attorney and founder of Family Agriculture Resource Management Services. It's been in operation for nearly about uh, 10 years, and we provide three services. Our focus is providing free legal services to aging um, rural small farmers of color. And that looks like putting the land in a trust, um, writing wills, also suing USDA um, regarding civil rights um, infractions. And then of course, um, why I am here, the focus is the food bank program. And so I developed the product, I developed the, I'm oh, sorry. But I turned it off. I developed the um, prototype based on um, my Feeding America internship back in 2002. And so what we do 
um, and with David Harper is what we do. We, I write grants, raise money, then I pay the farmers for their produce that will usually be composted. And then all of the produce is donated to rural communities. And we have donated nearly 2 million pounds over the past eight years in four different countries. And so um, we have operations in Sierra Leone. We started working in Haiti in 2015. We just built a cold storage facility in Arima Trinidad last year for farmers. And then we've also been working um, in South India off and on for the past two years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jillian. And finally, uh, Lainey. Hi. Great to be here on this panel with um, these other amazing panelists. I'm Lainey Singer. I am the chair of the Climate Farm School program at Do, um, a new online climate school that launched at the very start of the pandemic in 2020, um, conveniently always planning to be online. But um, I have been delighted to be able to establish our first in-person experiential climate education experience for adult professionals. And that is the Climate Farm School. It is an opportunity to bring adults, um, farmers and non-farmers alike onto working farms to live and work and communicate together and collaborate around climate solutions in the food and ag space. So I just launched this program um, at two host farms this past fall in September. Um, and I'm looking forward to growing the program to uh, better forge these connections between um, people actively stewarding the land with an eye towards food production, food security, and climate resilience, and as well as climate mitigation, and those looking to support that work, get involved and understand um, physically what it means to do regenerative agriculture and um, restore degraded agroecosystems. So it's great to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much for those introductions. I'd love to start with a little bit of a kind of personal uh, framing context setting. Obviously, you know, food touches on so many layers of our lives. It's, it's a way of making a living. It's also a way of interacting with the natural space of interacting with other people. And I'd love to explore a little bit at the start here, kind of how did you each come to your work and kind of maybe what was that aha moment of, of seeing I can use my skills here to help the food system work better for people and planet. And maybe we can just go around in that same order here. So starting with Julia. Um, my connection to food begins with my grandparents who migrated from the deep South to the San Francisco Bay area to start a dental practice serving the black community. And in that space they created at home and at work, all people were equal, all people were welcome and worth serving. So I've always believed that the best moments in life happen when humans are sharing food together at the table. My light bulb moment really was in 2017 when I learned that I was gonna become a parent for the first time. And I think I felt simultaneously a huge amount of excitement and also a lot of weight and fear about what it meant to bring another human onto the planet during such uncertain times. And so for me, the answer was to reconnect to my love of food and my belief in its power to bring everyone to the table for solutions. Super powerful framing. That's actually something I've heard. We had a podcast at Imperfect, and that was something a lot of folks would bring up that having a kid was actually this really interesting reframe moment. So it, it really powerful there. Thank you for sharing that, Julia. Uh, Jillian, could you share a bit about kind of what you what brought you into this work? Um, my grandparents as well, uh, working in the garden with my grandfather uh, in the 80s. So um, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, and he was raised on a farm in Oklahoma. And as I grew older, I learned how we lost the farm and he didn't like to discuss those matters. And so my great grandmother hired a lawyer to pay the property tax on the farm, but the lawyer stole the money and the land was sold in a tax lien sale. And now where my grandfather's house used to be, there's an oil pump going up and down. And so I reverted from biology and went to law school and I've been using law and science ever since for advocacy work. Wow, super powerful, uh, Jillian. And yeah, if folks haven't, just a brief plug, we did interview Jillian on the Unwasted podcast with Imperfect and her her full story, I would highly recommend listening to it uh, offline when you have time, really powerful and really, really happy she's here with us as well. Uh, Lainey, uh, following up with you here, what uh, what brings you here? What, how did you get into this work? Yeah, so my aha moment was really um, happened when I was teaching eighth grade in Boston um, as a Citizen Schools AmeriCorps teaching fellow. And I was you know, just out of college, struggling to figure out how to connect with my urban teen students and, and um, get them ready for high school. 
And the most successful thing that I ever did with them was talk to them about starting a school garden project and then get them to do that um, with a kindergarten. They were paired up with a kindergarten classroom and they were mentoring um, their kindergarten uh, younger peers to learn how to plant things and grow food. And this was like a revelation for my students. They had never grown anything. They had never seen that seedling pop up out of the ground. And they were just like totally hooked and excited and their best selves working with kindergartners to like pretend that they knew something about soil and food. And it was just really awesome to see that light bulb moment for my students. Um, and at that moment I was like, okay, I have to go back and learn more about um, plants and plant science and agriculture myself. I grew up in an urban area. Um, I feel really disconnected from my, I felt really disconnected from my food system. Um, and I've always had an interest in environmental sustainability and climate change. So went back to grad school and studied how urban gardens can be sites of environmental education, climate education, and food security in the community. Um, so did a lot of work with urban farms in California, where I was going to grad school, and did a lot of work with small rural farms in California and Washington state that were focused primarily on school gardening and supplying food to, to schools. Um, and that kind of brought me to this, like, okay, we're, we're all really, like a lot of people are disconnected from farms and food production. How do we rebuild these bridges? And in th seeing my role primarily as an educator, um, started talking to more farms about the education that they would like to be doing, the communication around what they're doing and why and how to value that, not just from um, having to try and high price point, but getting the community involved in the work on the farm. So that's what kind of led me into this farm-based education um, career. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lenny. Already loving the kind of diversity of experiences and yet also the commonality here of like of how food as a framework can really help inspire positive change and kind of bring out the best and in, in people's skill sets. Uh, in that vein, I'd love to do a little bit of a deep dive with each panelist quickly about kind of some lessons they've learned from their work to kind of bring them to light and help us learn from them a bit more. Uh, starting with Julia, uh, I'd love to start with some term definition because I know we're all kind of drowning in environmental jargon these days. So can you shed some light on what regenerative farming is and kind of why it matters in practice and any lessons you've learned about kind of the promise and obstacles of re farming regeneratively in the modern era? Sure. These are some really important questions. I hope you don't mind if I take a couple of minutes to answer this one, because I think it's great to, to get some good grounding on regenerative agriculture. But regenerative agriculture is an approach to farming that's focused on creating ecosystems that not only sustain, but actually regenerate or create all of the resources that are needed within that ecosystem. And often when people talk about regenerative agriculture, they're referring to a set of farming practices that improve the health of degraded soil and allowing that soil to sequester more carbon. Um, not only sequester carbon, but also improve what we call water infiltration, the ability of soil to actually hold water. And that's important be, for climate resilience. As we all know, um, climate change is causing more incidents of uh, severe weather, um, droughts and floods. And so we need to have soils that are healthy, that have the ability to sequester carbon, and also soils that have the ability to, to sustain these severe weather events. Um, the practices that we're talking about are things like minimizing the disturbance of the soil, or a practice more commonly known as no-till or reduced tillage. We're also talking about cover cropping, so actually keeping the soil covered. We're talking about increasing and improving biodiversity, the number of living things living in an ecosystem, and in many cases, we're also talking about integrating livestock. Um, the, the saying that we have in regenerative agriculture is it's not the cow, it's the how. And there are often many incidences where integrating livestock into a living system actually improves um, many of the elements that create resilience and healthy soil. And the thing about regenerative agriculture is there's no um, single set of practices. Actually, the practices can vary dramatically um, depending on what you're farming, where you are, your soil type. Um, so there's there's a lot to, to think about in terms of the diversity of practices. But um, again, the, the outcomes that we see as a result of these practices are things like higher soil organic matter, 
um, more diverse um, biodiverse ecosystems and um, better nutrient density. So food that's grown in regenerative systems actually carries more nutrition to our bodies. Um, and then, as you said, you know, Riley, at the beginning of the, the talk, we're also talking about humans, right? We're not just talking about carbon. So socially and economically, regenerative agriculture actually cultivates connection, place, and well-being among those who are involved in producing that food. I'm just going to talk more, one more second about kind of what I've learned and, and obstacles. And so regenerative agriculture sounds like the most beautiful um, thing in the world. Why aren't we already seeing it being commonplace at scale? Well, there are some obstacles that we've seen so far. Uh, the first obstacle that I'd cite is infrastructure. Um, and and it, in many cases, there are actually um, negative incentives for farmers who want to implement these regenerative practices. There are ways in which the existing farm bill or crop insurance actually de-incentivizes the adaption of things like cover crops. So we need to remove some of those structural impediments, those infrastructure impediments to regenerative agriculture. And then we also need to demonstrate that there's demand and motivate more farmers to convert to these practices. So a large part of the work that we're doing at Planet Forward is to prove that there is demand for climate friendly practices, for lower emissions um, suppliers and supply chains. So again, if we were successful in doing this, imagine the 1 billion acres of pasture range and cropland that exists in the United States. If we could reward the sustainable and regenerative stewards of that land, then we'd see you know, more climate resilience. We'd see a drastic reduction in greenhouse gas related emissions in our food ecosystem. And we'd also see better diversity, biodiversity and healthier um, farm economies. Yeah. Amazing explanation. Really appreciate you going into depth there, Julia. Um, Jillian, going over to you, I'd love to explore a bit of what Julia touched on with the farmer side of things. You know, based on your work with farmers, what is needed to make sure that farming is not just sustainable environmentally, but you know, economically and really equitable for future generations? And what what sort of obstacles are you overcoming with your work? Well, um, when it comes to regenerative agriculture, it's very difficult for the farmers to adopt at least either traditional small rural farmer um, because it's expensive. And the average farmer, according to the 2012 USDA census, between 2012 and 2017 made less than $10,000 annually each year. And so I know of farmers, particularly a dairy farmer in upstate um, New York, that, you know, they have fell on hard times and they're feeding their kids Cheerios and, you know, dry cereal with, with the cow's milk. And so a lot of my farmers are living from hand to mouth. That's why I created the Farmers Emergency Fund. The problem is that, you know, we're developing so much land, 175 acres are lost in this country, um, you know, by the hour. And the importance on urban structure is, completely ridiculous. I was a city planner at home in Kansas City for two years and just getting the city planning and zoning board to really consider the, the conservation, you know, conservation ease and pres preservation of acres and not city lots um, is very frustrating because people often look at the, the bottom line and, and greed. And so what we need to do is we need to provide resources to the farmers one-on-one. -on -one. We need to provide education tools and teaching. We need to make it affordable and we need to pay the farmers. We need to pay the farmers a livable wage. You know, often people say pay farm workers a livable wage, but 50% of, you know, the farmers in this country are small farmers and the average age of the farmer is 58.5. And so the average age of my farmer is 75, the oldest is 94 in Georgia. And so we really need to also incorporate more, you know, estate planning mechanisms or farm succession planning, but it also starts with paying the farmer where they're at, no matter the age. And um, if you pay them, they'll do it, you know, it may be slow, but they'll do it. But if you don't pay them, it's easy just to throw, you know, fertilizer Roundup Ready on it and, you know, it's good to go. And so the whole thing needs to be kind of upside down. Changed. 
Really, really appreciate that nuance, Jillian. That was something I learned from my work at Imperfect that really blew my mind was how little farmers were making, even for their perfect produce that they could sell to supermarkets. And then right. when, when I would talk to farmers and say, okay, but why don't you just sell your ugly oranges or tomatoes to juice or processing? They'd say, oh, we get 30% of what we get for table uh, grade stuff, which would often not even cover the, the labor of picking it, much less like the box they have to ship it in. And so I'd always try to flip the question on people of like, if someone offered you your job, but 30% of the salary, would you take it? And then everyone would always say, oh, no, 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 no. So it's like, okay, but why are we asking farmers to do that then if they have it even tougher? You know, agriculture is one of the toughest ways to make a living. So no, I really appreciate the candor there and the details you were able to share. And you really blew my mind in the pod when you talked about like estate planning, which is something I never thought was related to agriculture, but of course it's all interconnected and really love that framework. Um, Lainey, you know, wrapping it up here with you, you know, from the farmer's perspective, what are some reasons to farm regeneratively? And, and again, also kind of what are some of the things keeping it from being more common than it is right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And from my experience, I've worked primarily with smaller scale, diversified farming operations and mostly people that came into farming um, not being multi-generational family farms, but people that were really drawn to farming because of like rediscovering that connection to food production in the land or um, getting turned on as a farm intern or apprentice or some earlier educational kind of spark experience. Um, but I think, you know, and also from the few farmers that I have spoken to who have were farming more traditionally or conventionally um, previously, there has been this real impetus, I think, as we awaken to the climate crisis um, and farmers have experienced like severe crop failures and hardship and year after year of not being able to make the yield that they need to make and not even having crop insurance be enough. So there's been sort of a, on one hand, I think a climate impetus to change and farm regeneratively and people that love farming and food production have been willing out of necessity to try different things and experiment with regenerative and find ways to reintroduce life into the soil, reinvigorate a healthy soil community and microbiome and therefore grow diverse crops, legumes, beans um, into a mix that used to be maybe just corn and soy um, and grains. So I think there's that on the one hand and then there's others who have awoken to the climate crisis who see um, soil carbon sequestration and planting, replanting trees and agroforestry as a really important and um you know mutual like beneficial on multiple fronts kind of solution to engage in so a lot of farmers that i've spoken to um, maybe used to have careers in like banking or something completely unrelated or in some other cases commercial salmon fishing and have found their way onto the land and as a way to heal what we've seen as as you know what's been degraded restore productivity and health and nutrition into their local communities. So um, it's been, and I think in urban areas, it's been a big response of um, people experiencing food insecurity to want to grow that food within the community and just seeing the response. Um, there's been a lot of nonprofit farms that have cropped up all over Berkeley and Oakland that have, um, I think, just risen to the occasion and the need to feed their communities and find funding to do that through not just, you know, sale of, of produce. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of people coming to this work, which is really exciting, really energizing, um, but then also some really serious barriers, mostly financial and policy that I think Julia and Jillian have both touched on really well. Um, and I think just the, the model of crop insurance that exists today, where there are lots of dollars going to farmers, but just to grow certain crops that are not the most nutritious ones and in not very environmentally healthy ways, like that money in my mind all needs to be repurposed and rechanneled through a lot of political pressure and advocacy to allow farmers to farm regeneratively and have more of a whole farm approach to revenue support that includes ecosystem services and educating next generation of farmers and all these things that are really valuable about um, our food producers. Fantastic. Really appreciate that, Lainey. And that uh, would echo the crop insurance point. That's something I'd heard from farmers as well. It's uh, kind of under discussed that we're, we're literally subsidizing certain crops and also literally kind of covering the risks of certain crops, but not what many of us would consider food. Like what we all eat at the grocery stores to what's referred to as specialty produce, which I always found a really ridiculous distinction. So 
it's a deep rabbit hole. Would encourage folks to to dive down it. The deep but important stuff. Um, we I think have to wrap up by in about ten minutes. So I want to kind of get us to closing here. Um, you know, today is all about inspiration and action. So I'd love to pop around one more time, and just if folks have either a key takeaway they'd love you know the attendees to leave with, or even an ask, a thing you you would hope folks could do to help build a bit more of a just and resilient food system. I would love to hear it. Um, so yeah, if we can just pop around again, starting with Julia, what is, what's the takeaway or an ask you have for folks attending? Sure. I think it's often surprising to people to learn that 34% of human made greenhouse gas emissions come from land use and food systems. That's more than a third. That's a huge number. It's everything from the way that we grow food to the emissions related and getting that food to your grocery shelf. Um, and so one of the best things that we can do, there's no silver bullet solution to addressing the climate crisis. It's gonna take a lot of concerted effort across sectors. But one of the best things that we could do as people is to demand that our food systems become real zero. Um, we're not talking about net zero by 2050, we're talking about drastically reducing emissions in this decade. And so the ask that I would have would be to reach out to your favorite retailer, whether it's Whole Foods or Target or Kroger, or reach out to your favorite brand and ask them what they're doing to drive their operations and drive their supply chains um, to being carbon neutral. That would be a great ask, I think. Awesome. Uh, Jillian, what would be your ask or takeaway you hope for folks? Yeah, um, definitely I would like to focus on plastic, uh, plastic use and just the problem, as we all know, with uh, microplastics and, you know, it's in our food, it's just everywhere. And so reducing your use of plastic, also um, requesting the Biden administration to ratify the Basel Convention, which basically regulates the transportation and transport of um, plastic waste. And so a lot of the plastic waste, particularly in California, accounts for one third of plastic waste, um, is shipped out of the main port there in um, Oakland. And it's sent to, you know, um, basically developing countries like Malaysia. And we need to sit in our own waste. We need to sit in our own plastic because I think that that would accelerate uh, basically ways to reduce the use. And so why are we sending all of you know, our waste over to a developing country? And to me, it's just, it's extremely unfair. And so I would ask the attendees to reduce their use of plastic. And again, to ask um, the Biden administration to ratify the Basel Convention. Thank you. And to donate to farms, of course, 30,000acres.org. <laughs> cheap plug there but yeah love it no thank you for that and um yeah the the reframe there you you gave us of there is no away essentially super clutch and i really appreciate that uh laney closing out with you what's your ask or hope for folks attending here today yeah i would just ask that every folks here just participate in your local food system and building one if that doesn't really feel like it exists i think everything from growing your own basil plant or like some sort of participating in your own food production um, can start a lot of really amazing conversations, whether it's in the grocery store or the farmer's market or some form of connection to a local urban community farm or surrounding rural farm. Um, I think just having those conversations and connections is, is so important. And I think if you're able to notice like, what does it take to farm locally and organically and regeneratively? What's missing in my local food system? You know, is, is there a place I can bring my compost if there, my city doesn't collect it? Um, these are all ways that people can participate. And I think it just um, starts to see those kinds of solutions and systems that, um, that we can demand collectively. So um, yeah, I think there's really exciting things that everyone can do. I get really fired up when people show me their like frozen worm compost in their freezer in New York City and they're just like to deal with their own food waste and um, I think there's just like that that can feel good and resolve some cognitive dissonance that we all feel when like individual actions are small and potentially you know feeling insignificant in the face of the climate challenge but um, they do help us live a little bit more in in harmony with where we want solutions to go so 
I think there are lots of things like that. And I just encourage folks to participate in that way and talk about it. <laughs> Create a ripple effect. That's even better. <laughs> Fantastic. No, I love that. Yeah, um, folks, companies, governments don't respond to things that are not being demanded. So for better or for worse, you got to demand stuff sometimes. Um, great, great invitation for all of us to speak up, I think a bit more as well. Uh, I have excellent news, which is that we have some time for questions. I always worry with these things about running out of time and like we have such great panelists and then we all have to run. So we have about six minutes. So if anybody has a question they'd like to ask, feel free to either unmute and ask it or just pop it in the chat if that's easier. And we'd love to get any insight uh, we can from your questions as well. I saw one, I guess I can uh, read off that I saw earlier was, have any of you looked into the intersection of how do they put it, basically forestry and sustainable agriculture? Um, have you looked into the intersection of regenerative agroforestry and agriculture with a focus of protecting species on the verge of extinction? Yes, I have. Um, I did an internship back in 99 and we and I worked with timber companies on habitat species for migratory birds. And so when I started farms, I incorporated that experience um, with my farmers that are primary timber farmers, timber farms, and basically just doing um, regulated prescribed burns and thinning um, and things of this nature. And then also telling them about, for example, I believe it was the White Oaks program the USDA had last year where they were paying farmers um, to plant oaks and um, basically um, keeping uh, also wetlands um, out of production. But I, I don't wanna monopolize all the time and you know, Lainey or Julia can chime in. I think when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, we need to always be thinking about a whole systems approach. And so often there's a tendency to be reductionist and just think about the carbon, you know, what about that? And of course the carbon is critically important, but we really need to be thinking about all of this, all of the things that support a regenerative system, including, including the beings. There's another problem that we sometimes have in our language, which is we'd say people and the planet, you know, we're trying to protect people and the planet, but aren't we really trying to protect all beings and the planet, including these species that are on the verge of extinction. So that's that's just sort of my philosophical addition to the really good tactical information that Jillian shared. Yes, and I think that agroforestry is an absolutely critical piece that people are coming to more and more. Like the farm that I'm on right now is planting a bunch more fruit and nut trees in their pasture area where they have a small beef cattle herd because it started to get really hot here and their cows are wanting some shade. and so. It's different than the pasture management that they've been doing, um, introducing trees into that system, but there is a potential um, harmony along with this diversification of providing better shelter for the animals and also growing some more economic crops like, like fruit and nuts um, that can be harvested and sold into the local food system. So that's one example. And I think another cool thing to maybe highlight is the bird school project in California is um, focused around protecting endangered species of, of birds and setting up farms with the right bird habitat in forested parts of farmland that can allow these birds to um, continue to exist and be part of our, our biodiverse um, home planet. So I think those kinds of collaborations between conservation, um, species preservation and farmland stewardship are really important and exciting. And then it's also important for um, the Biden administration to basically update their forest management. Um, it's just very old. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're having so many fires is because of the lack of forest management. And so having some type of dual collaboration between the Department of Interior and um, you know, the forestry department within USDA is, is very critical. Super well said. Uh, oh, we're getting so many good questions. This, this always happens. <laughs> um, I think we have time for maybe one more one really quick. I guess I'll go chronologically. Somebody asked basically that, you know, they live in a rural area. They're trying to grow their own food, but the yield is not great. Any advice for folks who feel really dependent on kind of far away grocery stores? Well, um, I would suggest that they um, grow as a group. So I have a lot of farmers that grow as a group and 
you know, as we all know, 95% of all farm co-ops uh, fail within the first five years of operation um, due to the con competitive nature. And so growing as a group is definitely essential. Um, and so if you grow as a group, you increase your yield. And if you sell as a group, you increase your revenue. And so that is, you know, something to consider as you build up your soil health, the soil, health of the soil. And I think local food hubs can be really key here. I, the farm that I'm on is on an island and there's like, there's a small grocery store on the island, but the grocery wheel runs are like on the mainland. So um, there's a county food co or food hub now that aggregates a bunch of food from different farms and has a distribution system for getting food around to the island so that it does start to feel easier and more resilient to get the healthy food that you need without traveling really long distances. So uh, I think that can be, yeah, like growing as a group um, it could start to be decentralized or it could get a little bit more formalized if you have access to a common refrigerated space or some sort of, even if it's a volunteer led distribution system. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I think we are officially out of time. This has been such a delightful conversation. I hope folks can follow up with each other offline somehow about some of these questions in the chat. It's really, really great stuff here. And, you know, hope today is the start, not the end of this type of discussions. But I mean, I just want to thank all of our amazing panelists for joining us today. I know I learned a lot. I hope our attendees uh, learned a lot as well. And I really appreciate all of you attendees taking the time out of your day as well. Really appreciate you. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Riley. Nice meeting everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.